Okay, chapter four, tra income tax. This is trading income. Okay, so what are we gonna be looking at here? Trading income is a very important part of the syllabus and is almost always examined in one way or another. So what is it? Well, it's a person receiving trading income. Basically, they're running their own business. A person who receives trading income is known as one of the following. Uh, a sole trader, so they operate on their own. They're self-employed, is another expression. Or they're an independent consultant, so they invoice um, for their services. A person who is employed by a company receives employment income and is not trading income. So if you work for a company, which is your only, you are the director of and it's your company, you are still an employee. However, the services provided by the company, by our invoices, would be trading income. Okay, so now, a sole trader operates outside of a company. They just call themselves a smith and they are a plumber and they provide their services. They are self-employed. Okay, that's what trading income is about. It's not working for a limited company. Note the person can receive both employment income and trading income. So you could work for a company have employment income and you can also do your own part-time business selling items on eBay for instance that is fine you are uh, able to have more than one form of income something that um, we look at, at F6 is badges of trade what this is to, is to determine whether a particular transaction that an individual undertakes is a capital item and hence treated under CGT, capital gains tax, or is trading income. Now that's quite a good case in eBay. If you sell something, one thing only on eBay, but if you sell many things on eBay, is have you moved away from capital gains to um, trading? So what you've got to do to work that out is look at the subject matter. Are the items that were transacted typically items that are used for trading? So books would be a typical item used for trading. Property can be a trading item if you're a house builder. However, if you buy a property one and once only, then you're probably into the next one, frequency of transactions. The more often you transact, the more likely you'll be trading. So back to property, if you're a house builder, you build houses, you sell them. You build another house, you sell it. That is tra that is trading in property, and therefore it's a trading income. If, however, you bought a property, didn't live in it but rented it out, and never sold another one for 20 years, that wouldn't be trading income. When you sold that property, it would be capital gains tax. Length of ownership. A shorter period of ownership is more likely to indicate trading income rather than capital gains. Profit motive. Clearly, if you intend to make a profit by doing that transaction, it probably indicates a trading item. Supplementary work and marketing. If you undertake additional work, then you're more likely to be trading. Method acquisition an involuntary acquisition of the item, i through inheritance may indicate capital rather than trading. Now, basis of assessment. An individual who is self-employed must prepare accounts. You have no choice. These accounts can be for whatever accounting period end that you choose. So 5th of April is obviously an easy one because that's the end of the tax year. Having said that, you could do 31st of March or the end of April, and that's fine. The accounts are then adjusted for tax purposes to get the trading income from the accounting profit. The trading income is then assessed on the individual using the current year basis, so i.e. the income that arises in the 12-month period. So let's look at an example to explain that. 
If you prepare accounts to 31st December and you have profits of as adjusted for tax of 35,000 for the December 2011 accounts, then that trading income ends in the tax year 11 12. Because if you think about it, 5th of April to um, sorry, the 5th of April 2012 is after the 5th, 31st of December 2011. So it's in that period, 11, 12. Okay, that's, so that's when you, so that 35,000 would be into the computation we looked at earlier. Okay, um, adjustment of the accounting profit is something we've just mentioned. So if you had net profit per your accounts, what you then have to do is add disallowed expenditure, which could be entertaining of guests. Dis taxable trade income not included in accounts. There could be something that has appeared that isn't in the accounts. Less income included within accounts but not taxable as trading income. So it could be a capital item. Expenditure not in accounts but allowable as a trading deduction. And capital allowances. Now capital allowances is something we'll look at later but that is often goes against disallowed depreciation which is included in that number. Okay, Depreciation is not an allowable expense which is replaced by capital allowances. Okay, disallowable expenditure. Let's have a look at some of the general uh, rule, which is something has to be incurred wholly and exclusively for the purposes of the trade to be allowable. Some of the more common forms of disallowable include capital expenditure, depreciation through the accounts, so writing off your fixed assets, appropriations, withdrawals of funds from the business by the sole trader, Excessive salary, so someone who's paying themselves too much because they're a family member, so they're connected. Third party entertaining, so that's to potential customers. Please note that staff entertaining is allowable. If you write off a non-trade debt, that is um, disallowable. Subscriptions that are not related to the trade. Gifts to customers are disallowable unless they satisfy all the following. So you can make a gift to customers um, and be allowed if they cost less than 50 quid per recipient. The gift is not food, drink or tobacco. The gift carries the name, logo or advert for the business. Okay, capital allowances, chapter five. We did start to look at capital allowances in terms of the computation. It's basically, um, depreciation is an accounting adjustment which has to be disallowed. And what we then replace it with is capital allowances. Capital allowances are the tax man's depreciation and they're allowable against profits. There are, however, specific rules in doing those calculations. Capital allowances are claimed on qualifying expenditure incurred on plant and machinery. Plant is defined, machinery is not, hence there's a lot of case law in this particular area. Plant machinery typically in your exams will include machinery, vehicles, i.e. cars and lorries, computers, hardware and software, office furniture, movable partitioning, because there happens to be a case on it. What do you get? You get reducing down, writing down allowance of 20% on a reducing balance basis. So you spend the money, it goes in the pool, i.e. say £100, you claim 20% in year one, it becomes 80. Year two, it's no additions, no disposals, it's 20% times 80. Okay, it's reducing balance basis. That's what that is. There's also something called an annual investment allowance, which is the first 100,000 spent on plant machinery by a business in its 12 month counting period. 
um, you can get 100% allowance. So it's fully allowable, in other words. It's available to all businesses. You can't have it on cars. If your account period is less than 12 months, then it's pro rata If you spend more than 100,000, then it's still only the first 100,000 eligible for AIAs. Annual investment allowance, the balance becomes writing down allowances. Now, motor cars, there's been a bit of a change. Up to um, 5th of April 2009, it was one rule. After, on or after this rule, they are treated according to the CO2 emissions. So, less than 110, you get 100% first year allowances, which is certainly more generous than it was before 5th of April 2009. If it's in this CO2, then you include in the general pool and get your allowances or whatever. If it's greater than 160, then you only get 10%. So you basically, the more inefficient, you're in this pool category. Motor cars purchased before April 9, what you had to do is look at cars costing 12,000 or less. If they were in 12,000 less, they're in the general pool, i.e. added to plant machinery, etc. Cars costing more than 12,000 were called a special case. They were called expensive, believe it or not, which 12,000 is not a huge amount of money now. It's been this sort of figure for a long time. Um, the maximum you could get, by the way, was £3,000 per annum. Because basically, you've got allowances of 25%, but if obviously a car costs more than um, 12,000, i.e. 15, then you're going to get more than three, but its maximum is 3,000. Once the written down value of the car is below 15,000, the write down allowance calculator is 20% of the balance. Okay. Note the car always remains in a separate column, even when the balance falls below 12. Now, if a sole trader uses an asset partly for business, partly for, for private, then you've got to keep it under a separate column and only the business proportion is eligible for capital allowances, i.e. to be set against your profits to be computed for tax purposes. Companies never have private use. Sometimes in the exam, the examiner will try and trick you by talking about a director having private use, even though they're director of a company. Special rate pool, something that's come along Recently, qualifying expenditure on long life assets, i.e., assets with greater than 25 years, they attract a writing down allowance of 10% rather than 20, so it's a lot longer to write those off against tax. Okay, that's the end of um, that chapter. I'll see you in the next chapter.